My name is Dave Orwig, and I've been working here for about 13 years. And most of the time I have spent uh, studying hemlock forests, both in terms of studying the old growth forests that exist in this state, and in terms of studying the uh, exotic pests that are threatening this species. What happens in our forest when you lose one species? And more compelling uh, question is, what if that species is what we call a foundation species, like hemlock, that has strong control over the microenvironment? Species like hemlock that not only is it one of our longest lived trees, it provides a variety of habitat for all uh, sorts of wildlife, but it's also important in terms of providing things like coarse woody debris to uh, aquatic systems and terrestrial systems. It provides deep shade along streams, so things like fish that are really cold, that require cold water. It does a really nice job of kind of moderating that temperature. And the reason it's so problematic, even though it's so small, is that it can reproduce tw two generations a year. And it's actually active right now. Most insects aren't active this time of year. The other biggie is this. It's parthenogenetic, meaning that every individual in North America is a female capable of laying eggs. So you only need one to survive, and it can it maintain itself. Because it's so small, it can uh, rapidly disperse, mostly by wind, birds, certainly humans as well. They're on the underside of the little hemlock branches. Each one of these is an adult adelgid that has produced woolly material around itself. So even on this little twig, there's at least probably 50 there. And each one of those can then lay 150 to 200 eggs. So just think of the number of eggs that this little twig has produced times the branch times the whole forest. You very quickly can get up to the millions just in a few trees. Just a brief snapshot of where does it occur uh, in eastern North America. This brown, the brown colored counties are the counties that had uh, woolly delgate as of um, two years ago, and it has certainly spread since. You know, it's now in western Pennsylvania, it's now in southern Vermont, and it's now in southern New Hampshire, so, and even a little bit of southern Maine. So it stretches across the whole east, and it's about a third of its entire native range. The green is the native range of hemlock. So at least a third of its na ra native range is already in infested. And every evidence suggests that it will continue to spread throughout the range, at least closer to the northern portion of its range. All right, so some of the things we've been looking at are how do forests respond to woolly delgid? How long do the trees last once infested? And what could replace them? This is not a picture taken in wintertime. This is a grove of dead hemlock in the south, it, which is remarkable. I mean, this is a huge stand of, of hemlock that is now dead, and it died within five years. So we have the luxury of cold temperatures up here. The south doesn't. And so very quickly, we, we're losing some of our tallest known hemlocks in the country. Um, several of these trees were over 160 feet. And I only know of one tree in this state that's 160 feet, and that's a big white pine. So very tall hemlocks. You know, I point out here in New Jersey, you know, 15 to 20 stands are categorized as healthy anywhere in New Jersey now. So certainly it's wreaking havoc beyond New England. This view, which was just taken this fall, or this spring, I mean, these vast hillsides of dead hemlock down in the south. And they're dying very rapidly. You know, from three to five years, they, they're dead. And basically what we've seen is that most trees, once dead, they remain standing from five to about 10 or 12 years. Then they all fall down at once. Usually they snap. And then you have this, <laughs> um, just this mess of downed logs. But they'll slowly decompose over time. And so what we've found is in terms of what's replacing hemlock, is that it's typically a hardwood species and not other conifers. Uh, all it takes is a slight thinning of the canopy and you get these little seedlings starting to occur that very rapidly within a few years take over the forest. And what we're seeing largely is black birch as the dominant species. So there have been a variety of studies that have correlated high adelgid mortality with either cold temperatures or as a surrogate looking at latitude. As you go further north, it gets colder. You have higher adelgid mortality in the north than you do in, in southern towns. It's uncertain what, what role temperature will play. We certainly think it's slowing down the uh, growth of adelgid when we have several cold winters, but we need more data and we need more cold winters is what we need. Can we do anything to combat this pest? And certainly 
If you have hemlocks in your yard, the answer is yes. There are some things we can do, um, from chemical sprays to soil injections to stem injections. Some of these chemicals can last several years and provide some degree of protection. Of course, a long-term solution will require a lot of money because you got to keep doing it. <laughs> because you can protect a few trees, but if the trees just in the immediate area are also infested, they'll reinfest that tree eventually. The other big thing that's occurring is, is biological control. And initially, this was thought to be the savior, you know, Sasagi skimness. Okay, it was a beetle introduced from um, Japan. But to be honest, it has not been that effective. Of course, what's the potential problem with releasing an, uh, another exotic? A, it could become invasive, or what else, what else is going to eat? You know, they do studies that suggest that they'll only eat adelgid, but we don't really know that until they're out there for a while. You know, the one thing that I've alluded to but I haven't really talked about is that, you know, the loss of one species when it's a foundation species like hemlock has all these other cascading effects on wildlife, the habitat, uh, and so could lead to some dramatic changes that we're not even sure of yet in terms of what will replace it, how will the underground systems behave, how will microbes behave. Uh, old growth forests largely are composed of hemlock, certainly in Massachusetts and other eastern states. So now some of our oldest trees and some of our least disturbed systems are imperiled by this pest. And of course, you know, adelgid is just one of many invasives, so we hope that the approach we're using will also be useful for other uh, invasive species. So that's kind of the broad overview I have for you. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. A lot of this work was funded by a variety of different agencies and it took a lot of time to do, so um, well, that's hopefully a good overview for you and happy to answer any.